Jaitail worked as a journalist for 23 years before writing his first novel, Narcopolis. His five poetry collections include These Errors Are Correct, which won the 2013 Saitya Academy Award. Girls are coming. Dishani Doshi publishes poetry, fiction, and essays. For 15 years, she was a dancer with the Chandralekha troupe in Chennai. Her most recent book is a collection of poems, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods. So, not to keep you waiting more, we'll have a performance by Dishani. Can, you, can we have you on stage? Can we give you a huge round of applause to Dishani? Oh, yes. She has a... I hope this is working. Can you hear me? Is this good? Better? Okay. Hello. Dear reader, I agree to turn my skin Girls are coming inside out. out of the woods. Oh no. Sorry, we're going to have to re. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pretend that never happened. <laughs> Dear reader, I agree to turn my skin inside out, to reinvent every lost word, to burnish, to steal, to do what I must in order to singe your lungs. I will forego happiness stab myself repeatedly and lower my head into countless ovens. I will fade backwards into the future and tell you what I see. If it is bleak, I will lie so that you may live seized with wonder. If it is miraculous, I will send messages in your dreams and they will flicker as a silvered cottage in the woods choked with vines of moonflower. Don't kill me, reader. This neck has been working for years to harden itself against the axe. This body, meager as it is, has lost so many limbs to wars so many eyes and hearts to romance. But love me, and I will follow you everywhere, to the dusty corners of childhood, to every downfall and resurrection, till your skin becomes my skin. Let us be twins, our blood thumping after each other, like thunder and lightning. And when you put your soft head down to rest, dear reader, I promise to always be there, humming in the dungeons of your auditory canals, an immortal mosquito hastening you towards fury, towards incandescence. This is an ode to Patrick Swayze. And for those of you who have watched the movie Dirty Dancing, you might follow along. <laughs> At 14, I wanted to devour you. The twang, the strut, the perfect proletarian butt in the black pants of you. I wanted a man like you to sashay into town and teach me how to be an aeroplane in water. I didn't want to be a baby. I wanted to be your baby. I wanted revenge. I wanted to sue my breasts for not living up to potential. I wanted Jennifer Grey to meet with an unfortunate end and not have a love affair with a ghost. 
at 14, I believed you'd given birth to the word preternatural. And when mother came home one day, waving her walking shoes, saying, I lost my soul in the Theosophical Society. I wanted to dance as recklessly as the underside of that shoe. I wanted to be a pebble in the soft heel of you, to horse whisper and live on a ranch in Texas and love my blonde wife forever and have creases around my eyes and experience at least one goddamn summer where I could be like the wind, sexy and untrammeled and dirty. And it was only after I found my own Johnny and got rid of him. Only, only yesterday, after rescuing a northern shoveler from crows on the beach, his broken wings squished against the crockery of my ribs, only after setting him down at the edge of a canal where he sank into the long, patient task of dying, did I realize what I'd wanted most was to be held by someone determined to save me, someone against whom I could press my unflourishing chest, who would offer me not just the time of my life, but who tear out reams of his yellowing pancreas and say, here, baby, eat. <laughs> Find the poets. I arrived in a foreign land yesterday a land that has seen troubles. Who hasn't, you might say? But this land with its scrubbed white houses and blue seas, where everything was born and now it seems everything could vanish. I wanted to find out the truth about how a great land like this could allow ancient columns to crumble and organ grinders to disappear. Find the poets, my friend said. If you want to know the truth, find the poets. But friend, where do I find the poets? In the soccer fields, at the seashore, in the bars, drinking? Where do the poets live these days, and what do they sing about? I looked for them in the streets of Athens, at the train station and by the flea market. I thought one of them might have sold me a pair of sandals. But he didn't speak to me of poetry, only of his troubles, of how his house was taken from him, of all the dangers his children must now be brave enough to face. Find the poets, my friend said. They will not speak of the things you and I speak about. They will not speak of economic integration or fiscal consolidation. They could not tell you anything about the burden of adjustment. But they could sit you down and tell you how poems are born in silence and sometimes in moments of great noise of how they arrive like the rain unexpectedly cracking open the sky. They will talk of love, of course, as if it were the only thing that mattered, of chestnut trees and mountaintops and how much they miss their dead fathers. They will talk like they have been talking for centuries about holding the throat of life till all the sunsets and lies are choked out till only the bones of truth remain. The poets, my friend, are where they have always been, living in paper houses along rivers and forests that are disappearing. And while you and I go on with life, remembering and forgetting, the poets remain singing C
singing. Girls are coming out of the woods, wrapped in cloaks and hoods, carrying iron bars and candles and a multitude of scars collected on acres of premature grass and city buses in temples and bars. Girls are coming out of the woods with panties tied around their lips, making such a noise it's impossible to hear. Is the world speaking too? Is it really asking what does it mean to give someone a proper resting? Girls are coming out of the woods, lifting their broken legs high, leaking secrets from unfastened thighs. All the lies whispered by strangers and swimming coaches and uncles, especially uncles who said spreading would be light and easy, who put bullets in their chests and fed their pretty faces to fire, who sucked the mud clean off their ribs and decorated their coffins with briar. Girls are coming out of the woods, clearing the ground to scatter their stories. Even those girls found naked in ditches and wells, those forgotten in neglected attics and buried in riverbeds like sediments from a different century. They've crawled their way out from behind curtains of childhood. The silver, pink, weight of their bodies, pushing against water, against the sad, feathered tarnish of remembrance.
girls are coming out of the woods, the way birds arrive at morning windows, pecking and humming, until all you can hear is the smash of their minuscule hearts against glass, the bright desperation of sound, bashing, disappearing. Girls are coming out of the woods. They're coming, they're coming. Such a pleasure and a privilege to be here to uh, celebrate this visionary and powerful new book, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods. Um, I first saw Tishani uh, read in 2005, around the time you won the British Council's All India Poetry Competition for the poem, The Day We Went to the Sea. At the time, we were a very different kind of reader, uh, more traditional is, might be one way of putting it. Uh, your new work is a departure. How did it come about, the idea of combining poetry and dance, the two disciplines to which you've given your life? So I think I, I worked for 15 years with a, a choreographer called Chandralekha. And um, I worked for those 15 years on one dance piece. It's a very intimate thing to go so deeply into a work. And last year, for some reason, we kind of stopped performing this piece. And I realized that actually dance was such a big part of my life and performing was such a big part of my life that I wasn't ready to let it go. I'm not a trained dancer. I've done yoga and worked with my body in different ways, but I don't have a tradition to draw from. But I suppose I realized that I do have the tradition of Chandralekha, which was, uh, you know, a very immersive, beautiful experience. And so I think with this, particular with this poem, because one of the things that is the central um, ideas of the book is obviously about women and gender violence. And with Chandra, we had worked on something called the Yoni Mudra, and she had taught me one. And I felt like I wanted to use that as a piece of choreography and again as a piece of reclamation in the way that the poem is trying to reclaim the bodies of women to use my own body as a dancer as a symbol of I guess some kind of strength and um, you know so I don't know that it will be with all of my work I just know that it's for this one it came about very um, you know just very naturally. I saw Sharira at the South Bank Center I think in about five years ago. And there were moments I remember in the performance when the entire audience held its collective breath. And I think I wasn't the only one who asked the question, is this dance? Uh, it seemed to me more like a test of stamina, uh, a way of stripping the spirit and pushing the body to an extremity of endurance. Yeah, I mean, it is... Um for those of you who might have seen the piece, it's just two dancers and it's really about just the body and its possibilities and certainly working on it. Um, I also got asked a question by Akram Khan, uh, the dancer's mother, who said, uh, 
after the show, do you have any bones in your body? <laughs> uh, it was a, it, it's, a, it's a piece that requires great flexibility, and sadly, I think I've lost some of that as, I mean, I've aged with the piece. But um, it's really about strength, and in a way, because um, I think Chandra's work was also about training the audience in a certain way. So she always liked very slow pieces, and a very slow beginning. And she said, you know, people come from the outside with all their worries and their anxieties and their to-do lists. And when they come, this is not entertainment, but you know, they have to come and they have to collect themselves. And so she says, I never want people in the audience to sit like this. I want them to sit with their spines erect and lean forward. So I think she was working not just with us as dancers, but also saying that the audience can't be passive, that you also have to work your spine. I remember the opening thing was 20, a 22 minute um, second or moment in which you assumed one pose really. Um, you've written about Sharira, uh, which you performed for 15 years, uh, as a piece that transcends gender to arrive, and I quote, at an ancient andro androgynous sensual space where it is simply body being celebrated, where dancers can share their solitudes and inhabit the space of loneliness. I've been in the audience in the dark watching this piece unfold, as have we all, uh, well, partly today for a few minutes, Tell us what it's like on the other side in the light. It's one of the scariest thing to go on stage and perform, whether it's dance or music or theater, I think, but that's also the power of the live performance. As a writer, I know we have so many terrors, the terror of the blank page, the terror of are we any good, the terror of is anyone gonna want to read this, but those are private in a way and we suffer them alone, but the, the, the terror of coming actually onto a stage and offering yourself is really something. Um, in a way, it's also very beautiful because I think it's a very immediate response in a, which, is, which is what I, I don't get from books. I don't know what my reader is thinking in their room or whichever tree they're sitting under. That's a more mysterious relationship. But I feel like with a live audience, there's something very powerful and it's certainly something that I have uh, I, I've begun to need and, and to want in my life. Can it be a little addictive, for example, this audience and its response just a few minutes ago? Of course, yeah. I mean, this is the audience that a poet dreams of. It's uh, in Jaipur, you can expect it, maybe. <laughs> um, to, to talk about your book for a little bit, about the poems, um, the idea of the dark woods, as in Dante's, in the middle of the journey of my life, I found myself in a dark wood, is a powerful and recurring image throughout your three books of poems. But particularly in this one, can you tell us about the image in the title poem of the new book, The Girls Coming Out of the Dark Woods? Sure. Um, I feel like, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm, I hope I'm in the middle of my life, I'm 42, and um, there is a sense of looking forward and backward at the same time. You're at an age where uh, you've lost people and uh, you will continue to lose people and your parents are aging and all of this stuff. And so that's something I've been thinking about, but also a larger sense of violence, I guess. And so these particular woods, I was uh, in a bus in Ireland and passing these beautiful green forests. And I just had this image of women coming out of these woods. And they were an army of women with the weapons and with the panties tied around their lips and with their cloaks. And they are kind of some, I don't even know if they were alive or zombies or half alive and half dead or what, but they were fierce. And um, I think I wanted to, I held on to that image because I was feeling such despair of um, the fact that with all this violence that we read about, it sort of disappears and then there's more and it disappears and what happens to all those disappeared people? And so this is sort of a resurrection, if you will, and the poem itself is a kind of an anthem and a battle cry and a resurrection, trying to say that you know they will not be forgotten and we can keep those people in the present. I'd just like to read the epigraph. Uh, it's by R.S. Thomas, the poet, uh, and it echoes 
the French poet Rambaud and his image of shit and roses. Th these are the four lines that open Tishani's book. The fox drags its wounded belly over the snow. The crimson seeds of blood burst with a mild explosion, soft as excrement, bold as roses. Arresting opening quatrain. What purpose do these lines serve other than the foreshadowing of violence? Well, R.S. Thomas is a Welsh poet and I'm half Welsh, so I was happy to have this um, little nod to, to uh, the, the, my Welsh side. Um, but I think it was also the sense of, do you know, this combination of violence and fragility and beauty, these three things which I think come through in, in the book a lot, um, they kind of, when I read those lines, they kind of captured it for me because you have the soft as excrement, the bold as roses. You know, it, it just brought together, I think, the dichotomy that I, I live with and the, the dichotomy I'm trying to explore, which is to say that this is a really beautiful world, but a lot of shit happens. If you're tweeting this, that's the line to tweet. Uh, the poems, Girls Are Coming Out of the Wood and Everyone Loves a Dead Girl are apocalyptic, soaked in dread, elegic, vengeful, visionary, but they're also love poems, poems about delight and memory. There are formal inventions. There's a canzone, which you'll all instantly recall, I'm joking, it is the most fiendish and difficult form in the entire armory of poetry. There are two sestinas. There's a list poem, What the Sea Brought In. There's a poem of instruction, How to Be Happy in 101 Days, uh, essential poem. Um, I'd like to ask, what is your relationship with form? Uh, I'm guessing you're on good terms. Yeah, I'm on... on f I... I I kind of feel sometimes that there are poems that, that demand a form. Um, I know that there are poems that I've been wanting to write for years and it's only happened when I found the form. Um, I have a poem, a sestina called Memory of Wales, which I had been thinking about for a long time, but it was only when I put it in the sestina mode that the poem actually happened. And I think, you know, something like How to Be Happy in 101 Days, that, that came just out of, uh, the fact of I wanted to, you know, have this kind of self-help. And it uh, was commissioned, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And then the canzone came because we were in Calcutta. Jeet and I were with some poem, poets walking around in Calcutta. And uh, that was when I first found out about the form. And it seemed like such a challenge. And everybody else had written one. So I thought I better write one too. Well, um, as uh, Aga Shahid Ali most famously said once, most poets only write one canzone in their lives. I wrote three. Shahid said this, not me. <laughs> I wonder if you could just say a little bit about the narrative arc of the book, uh, the way the poems are arranged so that the reader encounters a range of emotion in four distinct parts, and how the collection is bookended by two poems, Contract and When I Was Still a Poet, which are both poems about poetry. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is what it means to be a poet. It's, uh, I love being a poet, but I think it's difficult to describe to oneself, never mind to other people, what the role of the poet is if there is such a thing, because I think we're a little bit out on the edge there, and sometimes I think we only listen to each other and we are trying to, to be heard in some ways. So that was one of the book's preoccupations. And then I think another one was coastal, coastal living, what it means to live uh, on the coast and to, to sort of be in such proximity with the nature that's fierce and beautiful, but reminds you every day of your mortality um, and, and makes you consider your place in the world. I mean, I was born in Madras, Chennai. I live on a beach outside of that city. And I think the sea is always this reminder of, of the smallness uh, of, of people, but also of, of eternity and, and that we are a part of that. So those are some of the themes. And while I was putting the book together, uh, they just fell together in a way. And I think it's also that you position poems so you don't want to have too many, uh, you know, depressing poems in one go. <laughs> and so you want, to, you want to modulate the emotions somehow. But of course, the reader reads in whichever way they want to. Yeah, in fact, um, Everyone Loves a Dead Girl is similar to uh, 
the girls are coming out of the woods and it has lines like, I would like to talk about what it means to suffocate on a pillow, feathers, to have your neck held like a cup of wine, all delic delicate and beloved before it is crushed. And this is followed immediately, the very next page, by a monsoon poem, which is completely different in tone and in voice. Considering the vast amount of ground that this book covers, is it perplexing or annoying when reviewers engage in a kind of reductionism and reduce the entire collection to one hashtag, me too? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, Jeet, because I think um, it's very strange to have a poem of the moment. Uh, certainly, uh, no one can plan these things. Um, I wrote Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods after Jyoti Singh was raped in December 2012. Um, the book came out just now. And then this whole uh, unraveling of, of, of Hollywood happened and Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby and all of the rest of it. And we are now living in a, in a great moment, I think, a very inspiring one, uh, where there is a possibility of change happening. Um, and so many people around the world have responded to this poem, particularly women, I must say. But it, and it feels wonderful to be able to connect because after all, we want the poetry to connect. But as you say, the, the book is about many, many things. And uh, I think um, you also particularly have this bone uh, about the lazy reviewer. So, <laughs> um, With me, it's hashtag misogyny. Um, just because you began with uh, contract, uh, just uh, if you could say a couple of words about it. Uh, it occurs to me that it's a historically, in terms of poetic history, a formal opening for a book of poems. And there are unapologetic literary references to Sylvia Plath and D.H. Lawrence's Mosquito and John Donne's Flea and Baudelaire's Hypocrite Reader, My Double, My Twin. What kind of formal invitation does that poem make to the reader? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that tradition of addressing the reader is, is a very old literary tradition. The idea of also wanting to know the reader. Who is my reader? Do I have a reader? Hello, are you alive? Are you out there? So the poem was written in that uh, vein, I guess. And also it was trying to say, um, look, give me a chance. You know, I think a lot of the times as, as a poet, um, we feel like we're sidelined because, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're in the library or you're in the bookshop and there are three people listening to you and you just feel, oh, if only I could speak to more people, uh, maybe they would also understand that poetry could save your life or that poetry could be this beautiful thing. And I feel very even evangelical about the what poetry can do because I know what it has done for me. And so this poem comes out of that tradition of reaching out to the reader directly and saying, look, you know, here I am. But there's also the little play, which is the annoying mosquito, which really happened that I was sort of woken up by this annoying mosquito and I was like, you know, whacking my ear. And I realized that, oh my God, this is my job, I am the mosquito. I have to be there constantly, you know, telling people, listen to poetry, it's great, listen to me, listen to Jeet, listen to the poets, find them, you know. And I think that's part of the job of being a poet. Um, and maybe it's always been the job. Uh, uh, going on from that, one of the grouses poets have is uh, when poets and novelists are invited to literary festivals, or some novelists, the poets always walk to the back of the airplane, past the novelists who are sitting in business class. You know, so it's a wound that we have to deal with pretty much most of our lives. So you'll excuse us the occasional rant. Yeah, I'm going to ask a last question before we open the, this up to this packed hall. Uh, you talked about living on a beach, and I noticed that water is a kind of a constant in the poems in this book, as are the sun and the sea, and the challenges and rewards of a life in nature. Uh, that's a new thing, I think, uh, in your poems. And uh, maybe you could talk about how geography alters and informs your writing. Sure. Um, 
like I said, you know, I, I was born in a city and I've been informed by that city or the city of Madras, which is 8 million people and a city that I don't really belong to in the sense of my father is from Gujarat and my mother is from Wales and I was always always feeling like an outsider because I didn't look like the people and it felt like, you know, we didn't speak Tamil at home. So this whole sense of geography, I think, is very important for a writer. But one thing that was always very strong was the sense of the ocean, the Bay of Bengal. I remember going to it as a child, playing in this, and the sea to me was the saving thing of this city. So now to live by that sea and to know it in a way that's not just going for a weekend swim, but actually seeing how things change, whether it's environmentally, you know, soil erosion, environmental damage with the trash, the plastic, the, you know, just life encroaching, or if it's noticing the tides and the moon because you're actually outside and you see these things in a way that you don't see in a city, all those kind of fed into the new poems because I was in this particular place and geography has always been very important to me and which is why there are also a lot of travel poems. Um, I've left home when I was 17 and a half and I've been coming and going uh, to this city of Madras. And I always think of um, Bruce Chatwin who said, you know, it's whenever I, I leave, uh, you know, Russia, I can't wait to get back. And when I'm there, I can't wait to leave. And in a way, I always felt that about Madras, that uh, there's never a happy moment. Um, and so the previous book, Everything Begins Elsewhere, was also exploring this idea of what is the seduction of elsewhere. You're always wanting to go where life is happening because life is clearly not happening where you are, you know? And I think this book was trying to put the roots down and say, you are here, you are in this place, and um, try to make some sense of it and try to find your place in it. So we're going to open this up. Uh, there are microphones floating about. Lots of people want to ask questions. Hi, uh, sorry. Uh, just got hold of your book yesterday. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I can hear you I, now. I think you've got a very unique gift for powerful imagery. Um, and I, I'd like you to speak more about the uh, poem, uh, How to Be Happy in 101 Days. Yeah. There's this line which goes uh, something like uh, the utilitarian values of violence. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, wow, you're asking me to explain my poems. I don't think that's allowed. Um, <laughs> um, it's sort of like having a bath with your socks on. Yeah. Um, no, the line goes, uh, yeah. Look for utilitarian values of violence. Use the knife lustily to peel the mango's jealous skin, to wean bark and cut bread for the unending hunger of stray dogs. You know, I mean, the poem is written in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way because I was thinking about the idea of happiness and what it means to be happy because we're constantly being told that we should be happy, right? Um, and as a poet, I know that I'm a happy person, generally speaking, but there's a lot of things that trouble us and that make us quite unhappy. And so in the poem, I'm instructing the reader, I mean the reader of the poem to be really indiscriminate, to be violent, to renounce their house, to give up on everybody that they love. And in that old sannyasin mode of going into the forest to basically renounce your whole life. And the poem is a bit of a trick because at the end, you don't really know whether even that will give you happiness or whether it will just make you aware of um, how inadequate life can sometimes be. I know that I didn't answer your question, but I think the answer is that I cannot answer the question. Is there another one? <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hello. Uh, so I would really like to say your performance was beautiful. And uh, what it reminded me of is how I felt very empowered in the sense that I was reclaiming my sexuality, sort of. So in that sense, I would like to ask that as a writer or as a performer, when you're doing such a work of reclamation of your own sexuality, a lot of times, personally, when I do it, I faced a lot of slut shaming. So how do you deal with it? Or how do you counteract that kind of situation? Yeah, um, so actually, um, 
the work that I was doing before with Chandra, Sharira, which is a very, very strong work and which definitely has to do with the idea of femininity in, in the bodies of men and women. We've had very, very good response, very strong, visceral response to it. But once in a while, people have said things because it felt to them like it was, um, what's the word? There was a German uh, critic once who said, who actually used the word pornographic because it's a man and a woman who come together, but we barely touch each other, you know? And uh, so Chandra always had a very nice response to that, and which you could use as a response to slut shaming. And the word is a German word, which is Rorschach, which is that what you see is the dirt in your own mind. And so you don't need to worry about the dirt in someone else's head, you know? Um, and, and I'll just say one thing, Jeet, that I didn't respond to when you were talking about the androgyny, you know, it took 15 years for me to get beyond this idea of I'm a woman on stage dancing about the, being in the body of a woman. Um, and really, I think we live in such a gendered time where we are constantly being reminded of our anatomy, particularly as a woman in this country, you know, uh, this idea of how can you express yourself uh, will you be safe if you are doing such and such things? And I feel like, for me, dance, at some point, the greatest freedom it gave me was to go beyond being a woman. Like, I love being a woman, and I love the power of it. But it's also just to, nice to take a break from gender and to just be a person, you know? And I love the idea of, of sort of something prehistoric and pre-gender, where we are just beings and so that's something I aim for but I'm a very realistic person so it's not really possible in the context but I think in spaces like literature and art we can aim for that which is a higher uh, higher engagement you know hello I want to ask a question uh, ma'am I want to ask, uh, just being a poet, what is important to, just to choose good words to create a group of reader, uh, a heap of words which can fascinate people to your poem, or your feelings? Because sometimes we are not finding the exact words we are feeling. What exactly we are feeling? We are not finding this, uh, the same word for that. So yeah. what is important to write a poem? It's, you know, I mean, it's the whole journey of trying to understand what it means to be a poet. Because I think it's not about, um, it's not just about feeling, it's not just about words, it's about creating a separate thing. And it's also not about truth. You know, a lot of the times when you write, people are so, you know, so interested in talking about the truth. And I, um, I remember one of my early poems, uh, I, had a, I had a first line that says, I hold my, hus my uncle in plastic bags. I was, uh, my, my uncle had been cremated and I was throwing the ashes into the sea. And then my teacher at the time said, why have you used the word uncle? Why don't you use father? Why don't you use husband? And I said, but it was my uncle. And he said, who cares? Like, the point of poetry is not to be truthful to the situation in life. The point of poetry is to make a connection. So if I use the word, um, you know, um, because I mean, and I use the word uncle in girls are coming out of the woods in a really sleazy, uncleish way. <laughs> So uh, I think husband and father have weight. And so I think what you do as a poet is you start to understand how to balance these things and how to mine words and how to take all the weight that they have and use them for the full effect. But the true thing is the emotion. What are you feeling? What are you trying to say? What is that? And try to harness it without getting bogged down in a kind of sentimentality about your life because it's about making it so that if you pick it up, you also feel something, you know? So I have to always engage with the outside person while trying to be true to my own feelings, you know? Jeet, you wanna jump in? Um, sometimes uh, when you fictionalize something true, the fiction is truer than the truth can ever be. And it deepens and makes it last longer than if you were being merely factual, I think. Abir. Um, one of the things I've always loved about your work is how you, um, you use different genres. 
and you often uh, mix those genres. You write essays, fiction, long fiction, short fiction, poetry, and dance. Um, I'm curious about what those mixes mean to you, and also the fact that you've stopped dancing this dance you, that you've been doing for 15 years, what that's going to mean to your future work, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, many years ago I met the American poet C.K. Williams, a uh, wonderful, wonderful poet, and he asked me, you know, I said I was writing fiction, and he said that he had been told um, when he was younger that he would have to choose one or the other to, to get good at it, you know? Uh, and, and, and I've always, in a way, resisted that kind of singularity because I feel that things feed into each other and um, I'm a writer and a poet also because, not just because of Neruda and Rilke and Kalidasa or whatever, but also because of films and paintings and people and travel and everything feeds into one another. So nothing is in a kind of isolation and I feel that writing within different genres allows a kind of freedom within that. But in, in terms of a freedom which I really need sometimes because I think it would be terrible to just be in that one world of either poetry or a novel, I feel like I need those windows and doors, you know? And dance, I don't know, I, ca I can't tell you, I'm so heartbroken because I never sought it out. Um, it happened. It was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful relationships of my life. I felt like I've lost the, the connection to that, even though I know that I, I carry it in me. And I feel like I have to have faith in serendipity and think that just in the way that I didn't look to be a dancer, maybe something else will fall into my life and that will be in a different direction and it will bring other beautiful things. We'll see. Yes, over there. Meanwhile, can you tell us a little something about how you first met Chandralekha? So I, um, I was asked to do a, a review when I came back to India in 2000. My first job as a journalist was to review a book of poems, a long poem that Chandra had written. And uh, that's how we met. And basically, she invited me. Um, I think she was looking for a dancer at the time. And I was taking uh, martial art lessons, culinary pipe lessons. And the person who would become my dance partner saw that I could do certain things. So he said, come and meet Chandra. And I was a bit terrified because she was quite, quite an impressive woman. She had this white hair and these dark eyes. And um, I thought, like, I don't want to go meet her. <laughs> and he said, no, no, come. She wants to meet you. And really, she, she, um, she just uh, took my hands and said, um, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing these days? I said, I'm writing, I want to be a poet. And she said, wonderful, what else are you doing? And I said, nothing else. So she said, why don't you come and work with me? And I said, okay. And that's how it started. It was a totally, totally random, just invitation. I didn't ask about the details of how it was gonna work. I just submitted. And I was 26 then, and I, I spent the next five years until she passed away, pretty much always in her house of swings, in the theater, with her friends. It was an education, yeah, and a love. Of course, yeah. There's a question in the back. Yes. Hello, over here. Oh. You just said that uh, as a poet, that there are private battles that you face. Am I any good? Does anybody want to read it? Things like that. Uh, that and then the whole question of transience, like whatever you write, it will pass one day. I mean, in the shorter sense, you will die, maybe the poetry will not be read. Then there are fewer and fewer people who read poetry. And in the, in, in the bigger context, I mean, nothing is permanent. So does, as a poet, as, as, as an artist, let me say, does the question of transience, of impermanence, disturb you? And if, if it does, how does one keep on writing? That's a great uh, question. And of course, I mean, impermanence is throughout this collection, the idea of uh, understanding the fragility of the position of just being alive and knowing that one day you're alive or one day you're dead, and it could be for anybody you know. And it's not just about death, which is the final thing, but just in, in general, you know. Um, but I think that 
in a way, if you didn't write, the consequences of that would be so much more frightening. Um, I don't know what it would mean to be a person in this world and how I would get any kind of source of strength or joy or beauty without having the chance to be able to write. If I did not do this, what would I do? And you know, in a way of thinking about the future in that way, I feel it's also pointless, you know. A, because after we're gone, we're gone, and who cares? Um, we, ha we certainly have no, no control over it. But even within our lifetime, what happens, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we want to, to, we, want to to, we want to be read. We want to have the books. But the books seem like a permanence to me. I think as a writer, I always see the books as a kind of permanent object. And whatever it is, they are there, you know? So it's a very difficult thing. And transience is one of those things that, I mean, yeah, it's, it's impossible to, to explain. It's, it's hard to negotiate because of the very nature of it itself. But I mean, that is what we're living. So we have to embrace it in some way and know that this is how it is. One last question, I yes. think. Yeah. The last question. Hi, Tishani. Hello, Jeet. Uh, I read, uh, I lis listened to you read out your, f your poem, coming, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods, in the first session with Shashi Tharoor, uh, the translation session. And I, I am really fortunate to have to hear it again. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to ask two questions. The first one is, uh, I could possibly like trace down a book that I read long back. It's called The Women Who Run With the Wolves as a possible source. So could you please tell the audience the possible literary sources that might have inspired you to shape the book. What's the second question? The second one is, uh, it's, it's a literary advice as a poet. So I wanted to ask, you know, uh, when we're touching the subjects of violence and, you know, especially topics that are very close to us and we might not want to put them out due to the stigma that we're going to face because of them, how to not hate your work at that time and, you know, how to how to just be, have the courage to bring it out in front of the audience. Okay. So, I mean, the question of a literary uh, inheritance or literary influences, it's actually impossible to, to answer for me. Uh, I've been writing um, since I was in college and decided very seriously to be a poet when I was 20. And I feel like everything that I've ever read has like is a part of me when I write and it's impossible to separate and to find the exact moment of or, or, or an exact reference of where something might be coming from. Um, so that's a, that's a difficult question. I, you know, when people ask who is your favorite writer or whatever, I always say it's the writer I'm reading at the moment because whatever book I'm reading at that time is the most important book for me, you know? And um, so, so I can't, I can't step back and imagine because I've read so many books and I've been influenced by everything that I've read. Um, in terms of the second question, how do you not hate your work? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, again, it's to do with the vulnerability of being a, a writer or an artist in any way, uh, which I think we also talked about earlier, which comes with the, uh, some kind of arrogance into thinking that you actually have something that's worthwhile, something that you want people to listen to. And part of the deal is that if you are going to put yourself out there, then you will get response. And some of it will be great, and some of it might be negative. But it's how do you deal with that? Um, and personally, um, on this very stage, I remember Jeet was talking to the American writer Donna Tart many years ago at Jaipur, and she said, she said, you know, um, I don't read reviews, right? I just don't, uh, whether they're good or bad or anything. And I think writers find their own way of dealing with that kind of criticism or response. Some people I know read a review once and then never read it again. Other people write angry letters to the editor of the newspaper saying, how can you write this about my, how, how could you let this pass, you know? Um, and I think um, for me personally, it's always been good to have some 
uh, distance from it, but I feel I've published some books now, and I still feel tender towards all of them, and I would hope that I would have that tenderness um, as I go along, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Tishani and Jeet. It was a lovely, wonderful session. Nice to take a break from gender and be a person. Touch